Welcome to the podcast about venture capital, where investors and founders alike can learn how VCs make decisions and reach conviction. Your host is Nick Moran, and this is The Full Ratchet. Shardul Shah joins us today from New York. Shardul is a partner at Index, a leading venture fund where he's made investments in companies including Wiz, Duo, Datadog, Dropbox, Squarespace, Signal Sciences, Expel, and Coalition, amongst many others. Shardul, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, sir. Um, Walk us through your background and, and your path to venture. Sure. I started at Index 15 years ago, and just before that, I was an intern at Index when I was at college. In between, I didn't find any venture capitalists who came to me at the University of Chicago. So I cold called my way to Summit Partners um, on the West Coast and started my career as a healthcare services investor. Okay. So you started at Summit and then it sounds like you made the transition to Index in 2008? Yeah. Perfect timing for the financial crisis. (laughs) <laughs> and and you also transitioned focus areas at that time or, you know, talk us through kind of your early years at Index. Yeah. Um, early years of Index, we had a separate growth fund and a separate venture fund in terms of team organization. And so I joined at the very beginning of Index's first growth fund to help organize that effort. Uh, I joined in Geneva, Switzerland. And, and at the time, we made an observation that very few countries supported multiple investments for index. We're a European fund. Uh, We're regarded as among the leading European funds at the time where there's a very fragmented ecosystem across Scandinavia, London, of course, uh, France, Germany, and so on. As, As part of that observation, I created a hypothesis that Israel could support multiple growth investments over a fund cycle, which is typically three or four years. And so I started to spend a lot of time in Israel. And it turned out that there are uh, two prevalent industries, ad tech, so advertising technology, and security in Israel. They're kind of the same thing, like on opposite ends of a spectrum. Security is like finding someone that's doing something and trying to prevent them from doing more of that, right? And keeping out the bad guys. Advertising is kind of finding someone and getting them to do more of something, like selling them shoes. So both were similar, but very, very different. Both were prevalent in Israel. And that kicked off um, almost accidentally, to be honest, on uh, an initial area of expertise uh, for me in, in ad tech and security. Separately, it kind of came naturally to me, but it was somewhat accidental. I developed one of our first communities at Index. We created an engineering community. Again, the observation was across Europe, many different companies were encountering similar problems, like how to manage a distributed team, as an example. And while I didn't have any answers, I felt community members could help each other. And so we created an engineering community. And these these experts helped me identify another area of expertise around cloud, cloud infrastructure that that I still hold today. So I definitely moved from healthcare services, which is a very regulated industry, a very uh, North American focus when I was at Summit Partners, um, to more technical areas. In the very, very early days, I was also a biotech investor, so kind of drug discovery with a focus on different hematologic malignancies. Uh, So I, I you know, cut my teeth as a public investor, but very quickly moved to, you know, different domains closer to technology. Yeah. I noticed your concentration at UChicago was immunology. You know, we're going to talk about sectors today, but can you give us, you know, some of the elements that underpinned your hypothesis on a geo? You said you guys were going to enter Israel. You know, what was it that you saw there that made it sort of potentially strong market for venture investing? Yeah, well, we had been investing in Israel for some period of time, so it wasn't uh, particularly new, but it represented an an opportunity for our growth fund, which was new for us on multiple levels. That being said, I think we underestimated, uh, frankly, the opportunity set in in Israel in, in the early days. If you look at the last few years, the number of terrific companies that have emerged with Israeli entrepreneurs, many of whom have moved to the United States, it is really stunning. Overall, 
you know, we've always had a view at Index that there's opportunity everywhere. The question, and again, it's a function of kind of being exposed to a very fragmented ecosystem. The question for us is always where to dedicate our time and energy and to be focused. And so in some sense, we've been more intentional about what we don't do than what we do do. So unlike some of our peers, we didn't build out kind of a business in China. We didn't build out a business in India. We didn't take a view and build out a practice area related to crypto. Part of that, I would say what's very different is staying connected as index. Um, so we're, while we expanded into the U.S. about 10 years ago, I helped create our San Francisco office that Mike and Danny stood up, uh, Mike Volpe and, and Danny Reimer. We've always been kind of one team, one dream, and not for purposes to like market on shows like yours, but because we're better decision makers and we have more fun when we're together. And, and I think that's really different. Most other firms have franchises. They share a brand, share some resources, but they tend not to make decisions together on a, on a global basis. And so when it comes to approaching geographies, a big consideration for us is how do we approach it as one team you know, versus hiring new members, giving them kind of a shingle in our brand and, and allowing them to go execute. Sure. Well, tell us more about that decision-making process. You know, how, do, how does it work at Index? Well, it's, it's few and far between. We open a new office like once every 10 years. You know, every year we get together and we talk about it. Usually I raise my hand and I'll say, I'll go, uh, whether that's Brazil or Bangalore or Beijing. And then my partners look at me and none of them raise their hand to go with me. New York was different. It was the first time a partner was like, I'm in. And that was Martin Mignon. And, and, and that's how we started the New York office. But every year we talk about you know strategy, whether that's geography or products. We often do make decisions, compelling ones like our seed fund that we, we launched. And again, often... We're deciding what not to do. Another example, um, some of our peer funds have been different, w- was in 2021, we didn't launch a crossover fund. Or 2022, we didn't launch a, re- launch a crossover fund, um, a type of business that many of our, our peers got into. So we have kind of arcs of conversation within our partnership over long periods of time that set us up to you know, take advantage of opportunities and be prepared to make important decisions with significant investment pretty infrequently. And I think, you know, most listeners are familiar with Index at this point, but can you give us kind of an overview of the firm, you know, the size and uh, broad strokes on on the thesis? Sure. Index is a global firm. Um, We're about 100 people, just shy of 100 people. We invest across seed to growth stages. So anywhere from 100K to $100 million as first checks into businesses. We organize not by stage, but by domain expertise. That's why I have emphasis on uh, cloud infrastructure security exa- as examples. Other partners have expertise in marketplaces or fintech or AIML. And that allows us to both create conviction and confidence in the entrepreneurs and the market opportunities we want to pursue, but it's central to why the best entrepreneurs who have choice choose to work with us at different phases of, of their journey. Very good. So let's start on the, on this expertise area. Um, you've developed your own, you know, cloud and security are are your key focus, and and there's been a persistent migration to the cloud, um, as many of us know. Estimates I've seen for cloud spending in 2022 are as high as 25 percent of the 919 billion in overall tech infrastructure spend. Can you walk us through your sort of the high level framework you use to kind of size up the market, key drivers in the areas of most interest for you? Yeah, I, I think you're I think you're spot on. So I think the the kind of cloud market represents a trillion dollar IT transformation. So it's really a platform shift and we're in the early innings. To your point, when I when I studied the market bottoms up from 2022 figures, my estimate was there's about $224 billion spent on cloud infrastructure last year. So I think you're really accurate with your estimate of 24% of 900 billion plus. My view is over the next five to seven years that the cloud spend will about triple. So there'll be about six to $700 billion spent largely across Amazon, Azure, Google, and then you know a chunk of other providers in, in different markets. Within that, again, to your point, uh, there's an area that's not particularly new, which is cloud security that I think will be a really massive opportunity. My estimate is there should be 3 to 5% attach rate of spend to cloud budgets 
for cloud security. And that's consistent with what we've seen on-prem and probably a little conservative with respect to how much people are spending today. So that represents a 20 to $30 billion addressable dollar opportunity for security vendors over the next five to seven years. What are the drivers behind cloud adoption? Um, it's this perfect combination of quality, speed, scale, and cost. What are the drivers of you know security adoption? It's by necessity. Some of the most important data and identities and infrastructure reside in the cloud. They become really interesting targets for adversaries. And as a consequence, I think there will be segregation of duties. Um, while the cloud service providers will provide a degree of security, most organizations will seek third parties to support a more sophisticated security strategy, which will represent a massive commercial opportunity for security vendors. And are there sub-segments either within cloud broadly or within security that are of particular interest? Within cloud security, the three pillars that I think most about are infrastructure, data, and identity. Though I do believe that the most significant vendor will consolidate the three. I actually think architecturally that's possible. It's also in the best interest of potential customers. It's also very likely in a recessionary environment where there are benefits in working with fewer vendors. So I think vendor consolidation across those three pillars is a really significant opportunity. Each of those three are important enough that the number two can be a pretty significant business in each of those three pillars. And so I think there will be a huge number of incumbents and new startups that are formed to go after that opportunity. Outside of cloud, I think there are going to be um, a couple of areas that are that are really significant. One is uh, what I would describe as kind of outsourcing. So if I step back for a moment, the world is is in an interesting shape. Individual companies largely have to manage their own risk by themselves for modern stuff like the cloud, as well as old stuff for stuff that they control and stuff they don't. And they have like very limited resource in terms of people and process and technology to manage all of that risk. In part, this is because the labor supply of security professionals is limited. It's very fluid and people don't have enough like money and time and resource to invest across people, process, and technology to, to manage their own risk. That's actually kind of more problematic the smaller the company is, right? They have even fewer people, even fewer resources to manage their own risk. On the flip side, adversaries like nation states, criminals, individual hackers play by totally different rules. They share information. They can use only like the most modern technology. They can play statistics and create automated attacks and just look for kind of the, the nails that are sticking up and you know, apply the hammer. And the economics are improving because of ransomware. Like you can create transactions or the political game. So uh, adversaries economically are growing and playing by totally different rules. And this creates a real problem, right, that I think is endemic to the industry, which is why security is such a resilient and persistent commercial market opportunity. So one structural solution, I believe, is to outsource risk, right? And I think there are basically two ways to outsource risk. One is through outsourced security services. And this is a established large industry that, again, is being transformed by a set of companies, one of which we're invested in. That's Expel. It's a, it's a business based in D.C. that's performing super well. And there's a number of other you know, solid companies in that space. Second uh, is insurance, which I think is an emerging category that's poised for significant growth over time. And again, I, I serve on the board of a company in, in, in that area called Coalition. There's a number of other incumbents and startups that are, that are relevant that I could speak to. But I think outsourcing is a structural requirement for our industry to effectively mitigate risk when they have insufficient resources to do it themselves. And that's much more of an acute problem the smaller the business becomes. And it's true internationally as well. Sure, Duel. We haven't seen enterprise-grade offerings reach the SME market yet. Do you expect that unique options for this market will emerge, whether they sell through MSPs and MSSPs or, or otherwise? I disagree. I think there are products that have serviced the SME market. I'll give you a couple examples. Antivirus solutions, 
right, which have been around for a couple decades, and there's a long list of, of companies, th- they have real competence in sales and marketing because it's often very difficult to educate and convince an SME that that's in their best interest. So it's not easy, but there have definitely been solutions that have been offered to SMEs. To your point, MSSPs, these outsourced service providers, represent a huge category of exchange of value with SMEs. Duo Security, Sneak, uh, which we're not invested in, represent companies that have a more approachable product offering that is self-serve, right? That is kind of two clicks to purchase, download, and, and use, which represent a different methodology to approach SMEs. So it, it's definitely a, a segment of the market that I believe is underserved, but it's it's not one that hasn't had solutions in the past. Shardul, you've previously discussed the importance of earnings predictability, but in early stage investing, things are evolving at a rapid pace. Um, How can you get a sense for predictability in a rapidly evolving environment of uh, early stage tech startups? So there's often a question of like, how do you think about valuation, right? And I think at the center of that question is long-term predictable earnings growth. As a public investor, um, and I think this is especially true today, where people are talking about growth versus profitability. I'm sure you've heard that trade-off in other conversations. I think what people are getting at is the predictability of long-term earnings growth. It's how you compare a bond or or a T-bill with a software company. The beauty of SaaS businesses is they have embedded in the structure of their contracts a huge amount of predictability. And the longer the duration of that business, the more predictable the behavior of cohorts can be. And then you get these magic things that I'm sure other investors have talked to you about, like NDR, the net dollar retention, which again, add a degree of predictability to how a business's long-term earnings potential might be. So at the earliest stages, I actually don't think it's about the predictability of earnings on day zero. It's about the nature of the business model to support long-term predictable earnings. One of the mistakes that I've made, like personally, and I will probably make again, is underestimating the size of a market opportunity. And I think the difficulty is actually forming a view on how imaginative entrepreneurs and businesses can be, right? The canonical example is Amazon, a bookseller that created the greatest software company on the planet, which is AWS. Who could have predicted that? Uh, yes. And without that estimate, there's no way to imagine what the predictable earnings potential of Amazon could be, right? So often, you know, people like me who are deterministic thinkers fall into traps at the earliest stages of believing in themselves that they actually know and they can actually predict when it's not possible. Like the counter is is well studied and described, like black swan events that are unpredictable, that change outcomes. Like everybody knows that. So everybody thinks about the lack of predictability and risk calculus. The opposite is just as true. People are not powerful in predicting opportunity and opportunity size. So for me, it's more of a, if I were trying to approach kind of earnings predictability at early stages, it'd be a question around the structure of the business model. But I I think that's secondary to, you know, how imaginative can an, an entrepreneur actually be? So how does one assess opportunity size and underwrite an investment to an outcome if, you know, TAM is largely unpredictable? Yeah. If I, if I actually knew the answer to that question, (laughs) I'd be wearing a different uh, pair of clothes. Um, You know, I, I think the, uh, what I look for is how entrepreneurs make decisions and how they learn from mistakes and failure, right? One of the earliest indicators is the willingness to talk about problems and quickly get to what are different solutions to step into next. So kind of that desire to not be right, but the desire to learn is, I think, a reasonable correlate to someone's ability to imagine more TAM, more adjacent areas over time. Second, I think there there are, and there's different archetypes. There's no one kind of cookie cutter model. I, if I were to try to generalize the ends of the spectrum, on one hand, entrepreneurs may be really opinionated about what the world needs. The, the example is if, if people uh, like Henry Ford, right, uh, people would have wanted a, a horse and carriage. Um, they wouldn't have imagined a car if, if asked about transportation. So sometimes I think entrepreneurs have an opinion that's unknown to a set of customers. 
On the other end of the spectrum, I think you can build phenomenal businesses and adjacencies to those businesses by being really dedicated to listening to exactly what the pains are of your customers and bringing a solution to bear. So there's different, and there's everything in between. So there's different pathways to creating a business, creating second and third chapters of a, of a business. And it's a very difficult you know, craft to form a, you know, the judgment of will an entrepreneur be able to, you know, crack the first chapter before he or she has the privilege to go on to chapters two and three. You know, I just uh, interviewed Rick Zulo from Equal Ventures this morning, and he had mentioned Datadog. Um, and he said that they did their Series E around a $300 million valuation and and look what happened. So, you know, was it some of these characteristics and some of this mindset that you saw in Olivier when you invested in the company? When we were chosen by Olivier and Alexi to invest, the company was eight people, $10,000 of revenue. In the Series A, I think the company is worth about $20 million. We knew very little. Uh, we completely, together with Ali and Alexi and, and Amit, we completely underestimated the tidal wave that was represented by cloud infrastructure. What we knew was the cloud would, would require a different architecture for monitoring. What we knew was Ali and Alexi were set out to solve a problem that they'd experienced. They were like friends who pointed fingers at each other to solve problems instead of being on the same team. And what they needed was vocabulary. And so with Datadog, they're kind of with a very opinionated view on architecture, bringing forth vocabulary. It was so conceptual and esoteric that they required Amit, who's now the president of Datadog, to actually shape that into commercial p- potential with a monitoring solution. We had no idea that we would launch now 20, you know, we fast forward 10 plus years, we've launched 20 plus products. It's this unbelievable portfolio of solutions that are coherent and cohesive, uh, such that they're, you know, delivered as one experience to, to customers. That comes from their focus on, on customer centricity. So we knew there was like authenticity. We knew that they weren't purists from a technologist standpoint, like doing things that were possible. Instead, they made trade-offs. For example, how frequently to collect information in order to serve a customer's need. There were real business trade-offs from a gross margin standpoint, uh, but also related to what was necessary for customers. So they made all of these decisions that collectively led to building a, a really beautiful business that was very competitive right at the time. But no, like we had no idea it would become a 20, 30, 40, like one of the best software companies on the planet. Like, yes, we doubled down and tripled down and invested out of every fund into every round, but I would have bought every single share on the planet if I knew what the outcome would be. But I mean, that that's, that's, the, that's the fun of our craft, right? It's having the privilege to work with entrepreneurs as talented as Olivier and Alexi, who, you know, rise to the occasion, you know, and to this day are totally locked in building their business. You know, Shardul, it's it's often the the founders that are making hard decisions on trade-offs. And of course, as an investor, we all want super high margin software only businesses that just are up and to the right uh, continuously, but that's not the reality. You know, how do you think about businesses that have maybe a services component or maybe, you know, some lower margin loss leaders or, you know, dynamics to the business that include these trade-offs and require one to think long-term and maybe sacrifice some near-term high margin in order to get a a much larger slice of of the pie, you know, in the future? The unsatisfactory answer will be it depends. So maybe let's talk about a couple of different examples. As a public company, you will encounter different shareholders who have shorter term expectations that can create either limitations on what you do, or it can actually create terrific habits in how you do things with less. And so the more scrutiny there is, let's say from investors, the more you're focused on those trade-offs, sometimes short-term minded investors actually represent scrutiny even if they're not asking the same set of questions. As a private company, you have more degrees of freedom, right? And so I do think the board and corporate governance can play an important role in 
helping think through some of these trade-offs. The reason I say it depends is, um, to your point, um, you have to consider market dynamics, competition, and how to use limited resources. So, for example, I made a mistake years ago in not putting great effort into uh, hoping George Kurtz would accept me as an investor at CrowdStrike. And at the time, the, the company, if you really squinted at it from great distance, it probably looked like a services company with relatively low gross margins. And you could easily make the case, you'd be totally wrong, but one could easily make the case that this will never be a high margin business in the long run because it, it represents a services company. That was just totally wrong. And if you look at CrowdStrike today, it's one, again, it's a beautiful business. So point in time, the nature of a business may require a fixed investment, which represents a different margin structure. And one has to have belief that it will achieve scale and efficiency in order to in, enjoy margin improvement. So that's an example of like where services can be deceiving early on in terms of what the real long-term potential of gross margins can be. Same is true with Expel, right? And I could go through that in more detail. Even at companies like Datadog, we now consider different components of services to improve the customer engagement with our, our business. Um, so it's, it's less about kind of revenue or profit maximization. It's about doing the right thing for customers. So it, it really depends on if you're public, if you're private, what the nature of your business is, what you need to do short term, you know, what you need to do long term. Every company is different, but I'm curious to hear what metrics and or characteristics you're looking for that, that demonstrate to you that a company has product market fit. Oh, I think there's two things. One uh, is qualitative. The second is quantitative. Qualitatively, I will concentrate on the opinions of really discerning customers. So with Wiz, I asserted that there was product market fit when the company had $1 million of revenue. And a number of individuals disagreed with me, but I had absolute conviction because of the nature of the customer feedback I heard from let's say, people with discerning taste who wouldn't do me any favors, but are friends of mine, right? Uh, the flip side is for a company that has really robust customer engagement data, even if they don't have monetization, it can be a clear indication of product market fit. Again, we, we learned this lesson from making mistakes. Like we didn't invest in LinkedIn. We didn't invest in Twitter. And it's because we thought at that time, this around 2010, we thought at the time revenue was the proxy for product market fit. We thought you had to be like 10 to $20 million of revenue to actually have product market fit. Totally wrong. Like engagement was off the charts. And so uh, when we saw the engagement data of Slack, when we saw the engagement data of Discord, we were absolutely convinced that these could emerge as really important franchises in the world. So to your point, like every company is different, but the two indicators, like, yes, if a company has like $50 million of ARR, it's probably easy to assert that it has product market fit. The more interesting, I think, characterizations of PMF for us have been a function of robust qualitative data or really rich product usage data. You know, as we think about Wiz, uh, Shardul, cl clearly they built a product that customers wanted and they reached product market fit relatively quickly. W was there also innovation on the go-to-market side? And, you know, how did that play out? And what did you see there that was unique? Wiz has a terrific board. Sometimes there's more character than opinion in the room. But with some really, you know, there's a lot of experience around the room. And a number of folks gave kind of conventional wisdom. And I mean that in a posi really positive sense. I think this is true for 99% of companies. The wisdom was hire two salespeople to explore if it's just founder sales or salespeople can sell it. And if salespeople can sell it, then like hire a VP of sales because then he or she can build a team. And if the team can sell it, then, you know, build out a channel. Like that's the traditional approach. Founders should sell like 20 customers, then hire two salespeople, then hire a sales leader, scale the sales team, then scale channel. 99% of time when there's a company with product market fit and software, that's the advice you'd give. Wiz took a different path and took a different decision. A soft recruited Colin Jones, um, who's the CRO of the business, uh, when the company was about $1 million of, of ARR. And that was really kind of a head scratch for many folks at the time. And even to this day, you know, when I encounter investors, they're like, you hired a CRO at a million of ARR? Like, that sounds nuts. Like, why would you do that? 
I wouldn't describe that as innovative, but it was definitely unconventional. Um, why did we do that? I think we played a small role as index in this, in so much as Colin worked at one of our companies for seven years. You know, he's one of those people who's like seven years, seven promotions. He has an equal amount of EQ and IQ. He has an integrity towards sales excellence and a humility to build a, a, a real function. That was, that's very unusual. He's very analytical, which I thought the combination of characteristics could be a terrific fit for Asaf and his style of leadership and the business needs. Now, it wasn't without total surprise because when Colin came in, he had his mentor and his mentor's mentor telling him this company doesn't have product market fit. They don't have 10 million of recurring revenue. And so we had to spend a lot of time with Colin on exactly your question, which is like, well, how do you actually assert product market fit? But when he came into to Wiz, the first person he hired was a sales operations individual. Again, usually you'd hire a sales rep to go to sure. the thing. Instead, Colin started building out the infrastructure, right? The systems, the processes that were required such that when we wanted to scale, we would be prepared. And it turned out we needed to scale much sooner than anybody expected, which is why the, the company was able to you know, really take off. Now, within this, let's not forget, like the market demand for cloud security is massive, right? There is enormous amount of demand in the market. When you combine huge market demand with a product that meets that demand because it's an excellent product that scales for enterprises, which is really difficult to pull off. When you have like market demand that meets a beautiful product, with a prepared mind as a go-to-market organization, all of a sudden you can witness what's never been seen before, right? The, the trajectory of the company. But I think if there were not like infinite market demand and you didn't have a beautiful product, Colin wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been as successful as, as he had. So, so it really required this kind of intersection of the three to be as aggressive as we were in building up the go-to-market engine. This is really good insight because often folks will come on the show and we get a lot of generalized advice about what one should do in a certain scenario. And often scenarios are unique and they require, you know, their own solutions. And there's people banging the drum for product leg growth and there's people banging the drum for top down enterprise sales. And, you know, recently I've seen many models have success somewhere in the middle, sort of product assisted growth. You got a combination of product led and, uh, and enterprise. And so I guess, you know, just, uh, want to honor your point that these things are not one size fits all. Yeah. And you know, I like, I, I hate the term product led growth. Like I, just, you know, I think PLG is like so misunderstood. I think people, because I mean, look, Datadog is one of the best examples of a company that has quote unquote PLG. And, and I think people want PLG because they believe it drives to capital efficient growth. There's a number of features that, that play into potential capital efficiency. That being said, I've actually debated with the co-founders of Wiz, Yanon, Ami, and Roy. They kind of are on rotation with who hears it next about a self-serve product. And my view is not to encourage them to build a self-serve product for the sake of PLG and the capital efficiency that we may or may not enjoy as a function of like that go to market nature, right? The, the rationale around self-serve and being product led is I think far too many people underestimate the importance of product ergonomics and how the look and feel and opinions you expose and how a product is experienced can lead to significant differentiation. And there are all sorts of knock-on effects, like how you consider telemetry and billing and how prescriptive the product is in encouraging a set of stakeholders to participate. So being product-led is, I think, more important in forcing an organization to be very, very intentional with how the product is experienced, as opposed to like just thinking about, oh, that's a capital efficient way to create, you know, linear growth through a quarter that's predictable for earnings growth. Sure do all. I want to transition a bit and talk about, you know, the startups that you're investing in and, and working with. And I wanted to start with sourcing. Are there any unique methods that you've used to source deals? And are you more proactive or, or reactive? I don't know if like any sourcing is actually differentiated and unique. You know, at, at a high level, there's inbound and there's outbound. With respect to 
inbound, the best channel, I think, for every venture firm is a referral from someone they trust. It's mutually beneficial, right? Because entrepreneurs who get referred to an investor will know far more about that investor and what it's like to work with him or her, positive and negative, right? And what the trade-offs are. A referral from an, uh, someone we trust allows us to characterize that individual much more deeply versus kind of a completely opportunistic, cold email into my inbox. Now, I started my career by cold calling Summit partners. So I have great respect for cold calls and I invite them all, but it's just much more effective when there's a warm referral. In, in terms of outbound effort from us, uh, to your point, that is, that's proactive, right? And the, the two main dimensions are thematic, right? So we're thinking about outsourcing. We look for the best teams that are focused on outsourcing within security. And that leads to companies like expel. The, the second dimension is people, right? Where there are relationships that we've forged for many years. My most recent investment, which isn't announced yet, we just signed the term sheet a couple of weeks ago over the holidays. It's an entrepreneur I've known for 10 years. I personally invested in his last company. I actually passed on his last two companies like three times. So I feel very privileged that he, he's allowing me to eat my hat and, and he wants to work with me. But we've known him for 10 years. We've been thinking about this theme for 10 years, right? Uh, so it's his choice, right? It's, it's it's actually his decision on whom he wants to work with. Joshua Mata at Coalition, the cyber insurance company I alluded to before, we didn't invest in Cloudflare multiple times. We didn't invest in the first round of Coalition. Um, I think it's because Joshua's wife, Gwyneth, likes my wife, Poonam, that we were considered uh, to, to even invest. But, you know, we led a really significant round. I, I joined the board. It's a function of relationship. Right. We had a prepared mind on the business model and, and the view, but those are the two pathways to being proactive um, on people or, or on themes. Um, Trudeau, can you talk about some of the evaluation criteria that you've used and, and or acquired you know, over the many years after having worked with many companies and, and seen some not work out and some work out uh, quite well? Yeah, you know, as a kind of a liberal arts kid, having studied at University of Chicago, I've learned the art of critical thinking, but I actually have no skill. And so for me, evaluation is very different from how um, some of my colleagues who have really rich lived experience can evaluate opportunities. So how I evaluate is not meant to be a model for anybody else. I'm a career investor with very, very few skills. My approach is to find experts understand their biases, and then form a perspective based on, you know, my filtration of their biases. Where that gets wrong is it's really hard to learn about someone's biases. It's really hard for someone to expose what they really think to you. And as a consequence, forming a perspective based on those artifacts can be challenging. But that's that's like the, the core of how I can come to some semblance of a unique point of view on a, an area that's esoteric, you know, like security without having any real expertise. From a evaluation perspective, I, we, we talked a little bit about kind of financial analysis and how I overemphasize usage and qualitative information versus the actual utility of like a certain scale. Like I think there is almost zero difference between half a million of ARR and two million of ARR. I think many investors believe there's something magical that happens at one million of ARR that allows you to form a view on a series A investment. Like I, I think it's just random. Um, there's like 20 customers or there's 25 customers, like what's the difference, right? So it's all about qualitative, like the rich, robust opinions, or quantitatively, you're seeing something that you've never seen before. Are, are there qualitative factors in a founder that jump out at you early in a pitch? Yeah, again, pre-pitch, I try to do a lot of work on understanding whom I'm speaking to, which is why I really value referrals. That being said, I'm really careful about not trying to believe that there's a formula for an archetype of a founder. I really don't think that's true. And so I try to be really open-minded and observe whom is saying what and why. And qualitatively, that can be expressed in very different ways, right? Some of my the founders I work with are extreme introverts. Others are extreme extroverts. Their style is very different. And discerning style from substance is like half of the art, right? Um, when I'm evaluating businesses, I'm actually, I go into every single meeting looking for a green flag to say yes. 
knowing 99% of the time, I'm, uh, you know, the answer is no, without the illusion that I'm actually the decision maker, the entrepreneur is the decision maker. So I'm always seeking yes, which allows me to always, you know, be optimistic about any founder can have a qualitative ingredient that can be super powerful. Interesting. Um, Chardul, you talked before sort of about uh, decisions at, at the firm level with opening new offices and launching new strategies. Is, is there a uh, approach that you all use when it comes to investment decisions? You know, is it a, a group decision? Is it an individual, you know, making an impassioned pitch? How do decisions get made on investments at Index? We tend to, like I said, make better decisions and have fun when we're together. However, we, we recognize that in our business, we have to be agile. And so typically we have a process and we break process when necessary. So examples of this, our, our typical process, it can be very short. We have domain expertise, we'll have a referral. And as a consequence, we have a prepared mind to be very decisive very quickly. The first time I met Asaf when I was served on the board of his previous company, Asaf is the founder of Wiz. I met him on Thursday. We had a signed term sheet on Monday. Like it was a very short process. Doesn't say that we weren't diligent. We talked to 10 customers. We analyzed the business. We understood the market opportunity. We were prepared to make a decision, right? So I think when we, when all of those things kind of click together, we can be really lightning fast. A typical process for a seed investment will have fewer decision makers in an investment committee than a growth stage investment that's you know maybe a $100 million investment. So we have different quorums that could be on Mondays or Thursdays or Wednesdays or the weekend, whenever it's necessary, right? But we'll expand the size of the decision-making group kind of proportionate to the dollars we invest, as that's a reasonable proxy for you know how much time we may need in prosecuting a deal. But then we break process, right? A couple of us had dinner with Jason from Discord. We were like, holy shit, this usage is off the charts. We got to go. We broke all our processes. Slack, you know, Danny, Mike, and I were with Stuart Butterfield. It was absolutely incredible. We'd never seen this before. We have to break all our processes. I, I don't think we've had a situation where it's just like one person making an impassioned pitch. It doesn't play to like who we are, but in some sense, rules are meant to be broken. You sure do all. I'm curious, what prompted the move to New York City? Yeah. Um, New York's not new for index. We've had over 20 investments here uh, for many, many decades. The opportunity we see is expats, from both Europe as well as different parts of the United States moving to New York. So we believe there will be a population of new entrepreneurship in New York. And second, we will be alumni from a number of the success stories over the last decade, both of which are opportunities we think we're really prepared to, to be the primary investor behind. Internally, it's very convenient that New York is equidistant from London and San Francisco. It allows us as New York to be a bridge across our offices. And again, it's so important to us um, to be one team, to you know have one dream. And, and it's actually not external at all. It's purely for internal purposes, we think we're going to work closer together by having these three offices. And then finally here, Shardul, what's the best way for listeners to connect with you? A referral through you is probably the, the best. If you, if you met folks for me, <laughs> that'd be great. Um, absent a referral, uh, cold email is just fine. Well, he is Shardul Shah. The uh, firm is Index Venture. Shardul, thanks so much for the insight and the advice today. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. See ya. Thank you, sir. Take care. All right, that'll wrap up today's interview. If you enjoyed the episode or a previous one, let the guest know about it. Share your thoughts on social or shoot them an email. Let them know what particularly resonated with you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that some of the smartest folks in venture are willing to take the time and share their insights with us. If you feel the same, a compliment goes a long way. Okay, that's a wrap for today. Until next time, remember to overprepare, choose carefully, and invest confidently. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you.